computer. There we go. So everything we say can and will be used against you. All right. So this talk, and thank you, Edith, for the suggestion or reminding me that I had it sitting around on my hard drive. It's Swordswoman with a slash, the history of women and the queen of weapons. And I kind of turned this into a chapter in my Game of Thrones book, which is um, pretty cool. Only there I related, related it to Game of Thrones and sort of paradigms. But what I want to do is I want to kind of give a history of women and women in fencing. Um, kind of cool. So in a world where political enfranchisement, that is me being someone, being power, be, having political power, right, having a say, amounts to bearing arms, what's the place of women? Since, of course, women aren't supposed to carry, use, or train in weapons. Well, you know, allegedly. Yet women nonetheless sought or were thrust into violent situations or even because of who they were, what family they were born into, they were expected to even lead army. So what I'm going to talk about is really three paradigms or models for women who had recourse to arms in history. And by history, by the scope, I'm going to talk really from the high Middle Ages, from really the 11th century, really up through the end of the 19th century. So we're going to do some medieval history, some early modern history, some modern history. But we're going to talk about women as military leaders, uh, often by virtue of, uh, what again, what family they'd been born into. Um, women as individual combatants, legitimately, um, either in real history or in literature and imagination. And women as transgressors or criminals, the other way in which women might be seen, might enter into combat. Um, there's also, we'll add to that, um, women in sport, right? Women is, is fencing as a sport, but I'll put that kind of at the end. And of course, these aren't mutually exclusive in what role women were cast in were changed over time. And it changed as a result of other forces beyond anything else. And we're gonna see that shift, which I think is a very interesting shift. And there's of course the, the fourth one, the fourth paradigm, women dispenser, women for sport, for pleasure, for exercise. So the literature, and there's a, a lot of literature in medieval and early modern warfare, is that women did not use swords, right? Women who appear in, for instance, legal sources, that is legal records, like arrests, trials, things like that, tend to be lower middle class. And they tended to inflict violence on other people, other women, men, domestic situations. Of course, most violence happens in the home with domestic items close at hand frying pans, kitchen knives, tools that you tend to have lying around. Another way women might be aggressive is in sort of enforcing the community's morals. So if somebody, say, uh, was disliked in the community, maybe they just, you know, rumors were spread about them, um, they kept a disorderly house, whatever, they might physically attack your house. They might smear excrement on your door right, as if, this is in uh, Renaissance Italy, as a sign of disapproval of the way you're conducting your life. Uh, they might sing uh, rude songs about you outside your house, things like that, all of which is aggression, but not necessarily sword fighting, right? This is all taking into account sort of uh, criminal activity, if you would. Um, the sword being, and here's, uh, oh, well, Ryan, is this, this, this might look familiar, that diagram there. That's a Peter Johansson diagram. Hey, well, what do you know? What do you know? The sword is uh, the, a masculine symbol. It's, it's phallic, right? It's the male cat, uh, knight, the chevalier's place in the world to fight. Women's identity, this is per Ruth Mar Mazel Karras in her um, book, which I encourage you to look up, really good book on medieval gender roles, uh, Boys to Men, I think it is. Women's identity came through marriage. Um, on the other hand, one of the duties of the knightly class, the enfranchised class, is the administration of justice, which considering women were, you know, half, half of the noble class was women and sometimes there was not a man around to administer things. It's not solely the province of men. And of course, there are a lot of circumstances in which women could legitimately fight. So I'll begin this with women who actually wielded swords in their own right. And then as we start seeing a shift in the gender regime around the 16th century, as we start getting into the early modern period, move on to some of the more transgressive periods. So let's really start in late antiquity. Let's talk about the, uh, the peoples who moved in 
uh, as Rome started dissolving. So uh, this is a fourth to early fifth century. It's the Psychomachia of Prudentius. So this is a Christian writer and he's basically writing about virtues and he, he imagines the virtues and the vices as, um, as, as women, as women combatants. So here's chastity or pudicitia uh, fighting, of course, lust with her burning torches and she's got arrows and a shield and I have them being gonna be boarded by a cat in a moment. Um, and so women, you can portray um, women as combatants, um, at least in, as in this sort of allegorical sense. So there is patience, um, smite, uh, sorry, that's, sorry, that's, that's wrath, smiting patience and her sword breaks. And she's just like, yeah, go ahead. Um, and then of course there's faith, um, throwing down and then, uh, and then tying up, uh, I guess, disbelief, right? But this is not, of course, reality. This is imagination. What about in um, other uh, early medieval cultures? Well, in uh, Norse culture and Viking sagas like Brunhilde and the Volsen saga, uh, and three women in the, the slightly more historically based Gesta Denorum, there are a few sources for female fighters. And there's, of course, also those famous graves. Uh, here's the osteoarchaeology thing where women were buried with weapons, right? Skeletons are, are dug up and people just identified them as male until later on they more closely examined, like, wait, there are women being buried with weapons here. Um, and even in I legal sources, in Icelandic law, a woman could prosecute, you know, can carry out a blood feud, even if she had no surviving male relatives. But of course, um, Germanic culture, early Germanic culture, you know, depends, we're talking about a diversity of peoples here, right? It's not like one, you know, one Volks culture, right? As the alt right might say, it's anti-feminist. And the Lombards, the people who came in and moved into uh, Italy, even forbade women from carrying weapons or taking part in, uh, in duels or anything like that, or feuds. Um, but medieval society changed in, in the 10th and 11th century, uh, centuries concubinage, where actually these dramatic chieftains could have multiple wives, Charlemagne did, um, changed to single marriage that was um, enforced by the church and a dowry system as opposed to a bride price. So if a woman comes into marriage with um, money of her own, resources of her own, she's going to be more valued than if she's merely purchased from her father. Um, and with that comes an improvement in the social place of women. And we begin seeing um, that broadly a revolution in um, how much women are valued in society, women's place in society, and women being able to, especially to control property. And of course, with property in this era comes authority. And so we begin seeing women with this military authority. Um, I detail a few of these changes here. Right? Marriage becomes a sacrament in the 11th century, so the church controls it. Uh, the disappearance, disappearance of what they called concubinage, that you only have one official wife and, well, she doesn't produce heirs, sorry, you don't get official heirs. I mean, there are many exceptions to this over, over the centuries and especially of bastards inheriting. The Deste family of Ferrara was through the 14th and 15th century, you know, most of the uh, heirs were, were, were bastards. Um, but further, the church forbade divorce. Uh, the church made consent, right? We all very much into consent these days, but with consent originally meant was, yes, I agree to marry this person as opposed to your family saying, uh, guess what, you're now married and uh, our lands are together. Some people argue, Jack Goody, for instance, that uh, this makes you more likely to die without heirs and donate your property than the church, but it does also have the effect that your property is your property and not your family's property, which means also that if a woman comes to inherit, this is gonna be, uh, then she's gonna be the one ruling the, the, ruling the roost, as it were. Um, and uh, you can see this also in things like the beginning of the cult of the virgin, right? That the cult of the virgin takes place, takes off, especially in um, southern France, or what's now France, right? The Mediterranean areas of France, where um, the where uh, the Mediterranean areas of, uh, of France, where the the um, the laws particularly favored female inheritance, and. Let's move ahead, right? So here's Matilda of Tuscany. My friend Valides has done a lot to study her. And born 1046, right? So 20 years before, uh, before William conquers England, right? And she is born, she, her family uh, castles uh, Carnosa in Tuscany. Tuscany is sort of central 
Italy where Florence is. And she's the daughter of Beatrice of Lorraine. And she's known as a commander of troops. She's the last heir of the house of Canossa. Um, she has a husband named Godfrey the Hunchback. She was not happy with him. He was actually murdered in 1076 uh, by the old um, hide in the outhouse and shove a spear up his butt technique. And um, she took an active part in uh, the investiture controversy or the, the, the conflict between Gregory VII and um, the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV, who was also her cousin. And then at the age of 40, she gets married to uh, Wealth V, who's the heir to Bavaria, which is a fantastic, fantastically rich uh, duchy, of course, in Southern German states. He never consummates the marriage, but um, his, still, his name still becomes kind of uh, synonymous with the uh, Gelf party, the, who are resistant to the Holy Roman Emperor who is the de facto ruler of Germany, who also claims Italy through, well, through uh, the 19th century, right? So she rules a huge chunk of Northern Italy till she dies in 1115, fights two wars with the German emperor, Henry IV. And does she command troops in her own right? Did she leave from the front? Did she wear armor? We, there's no evidence that there was some male general, male war, war leader. She most likely, you know, the only real explanation we can have is she's a woman who wore armor, and she's the heir to the she's the heir she has these she has these uh troops behind her and um she goes and you know you lead from the front in those days and she most likely did even she didn't actually take part in battle she was certainly there on the battlefield and she's not the only woman amongst her contemporaries to command troops um Cicel Gator of Salerno she's born in southern uh, Southern Italy, uh, Salerno, uh, though she's actually of uh, Lombard, she, she's, a, she's a Lombard, uh, which is Germanic peoples, right? And um, she's the wife of Robert Giesgard, who, uh, Robert the Fox, who is the Norman who conquers basically Southern Italy, starts the Duchy of Naples. And she prevents her men from freeing the battle. She holds castles, right? One big thing that women do in the Middle Ages, they defend the castle. Uh, take the charge of castle defense while men are on campaign, campaign. And of course, this was a political marriage. Robert Gleesgard, who you know conquers southern Italy, marries her and needs to marry her for his political legitimacy. Um, the next generation after that, numerous women participated in the Crusades. Because um, Crusades armies or armies in the pre-modern period, I mean, the movies show them it's just a bunch of men. No, there were women in armies. There had to be. There was gendered work that needed to be done, like you know, cooking, cleaning, washing, um, not to mention prostitution. Um, here in this end, women, you know, in these situations um, took part in, in this, right? Women here, the women were bringing water and they're in a battle situation. They could be hurt, they could be killed, right? They are, if not mention themselves as combatants, though later on they are, especially um, in sieges and especially shooting arrows and such and projectile weapons. Um, but, and the women, you know, the women are key to the battle resistance here. Um, women followed the army, they were there and they're still killed in action. They especially also did like dangerous work, like digging, you know, and siege works and things. And some, especially Muslim, ho um, hostile Muslim accounts have women fighting in, especially, um, in, you know, in extremis and, um, in certain, um, you know, when it comes down to the last stand, yeah, everyone's going to fight. Um, example of a female crusader, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor of Aquitaine, of course, inherited the Duchy of Aquitaine, and she brought her own troops, her own family troops, on crusade when she came um, on the Second Crusade with, with uh, King Louis of France, her husband. And chroniclers describe her as wearing armor. Whether she actually went to the battle herself, we don't know, but she certainly wore armor. Um, and of course, the crusades are unusual. Right, and of course, here is a woman, guys trying to climb the balance. Here's a woman smiting him. And this, if you think of the, the rhetoric of this, right, it's also shameful to the Muslim that he's being bested by a woman too. Right, thinking of the misogynistic medieval mind. Um, and women fought in defenses of castles or say their homes, like Nicola de la Haye, the sheriff of Lincolnshire. She had, she was a sheriff, right? She was a notable of the of the shire, the shire reeve. Literally, that's what a sheriff is. And she's the one in charge of maintaining law and order in Lincolnshire, in, in England. And she defends the castle um, during the, the baronial wars, 1191, 1216, she defends the castle. Um, 
same thing. This happened very, very, Spain was a frontier society and this happened a lot. Um, Raymond, uh, Counts of Barcelona, forms an, an order to honor the women Tortosa who fought off the Moors in the siege, right? Women were admitted to the military order of Santiago, St. James, and the order of glory of St. Mary. So, you know, here they're actually recognizing women for exploits in battle. So in short, as Val says, the husband was only able to go on crusade because he knew his wife was able to defend the castle. And later, of course, in the 15th century, when the castle of love defended by women who would shower roses and such on the knights, you know, fighting would became a tournament trope and works nicely as a metaphor even for chastity. So um, there's rare accounts of women as combatants. Petrarch, 1340, uh, 1343, the Aragonese, the, uh, the House of Aragon was attacking uh, the area around Naples because of course they wanted it. And uh, Maria Puzzoli, uh, Petrarch mentions this in a erudite Latin letter about this warrior woman who he is remarkably strong and skilled. Um, mentioned by her, right? Um, during the War of the Breton Succession, which is part of the Hundred Years' War, which is briefly a generations long struggle to see if the King of England would also be the King of France, uh, John de Dampierre, Countess of Montfort, um, defended her castle by leading a, a sortie, a mission beyond the walls that burned the enemy camp during, when they besieged her castle of Hennebont in 1342. And she also uh, commanded a sea battle where she's noted as fighting with a, a glaive, a sword. Um, so she uh, leads the fighting and she wields a sword herself in the sea battle. Um, less substantiated, the arms of the Dudley of England have this woman, uh, supposedly Agnes Haltot, who married to Dudleys, who defeated a man in a judicial duel and because her father was sick in the 1370s. Very unlikely judicial duels did not happen in England at, in this period. Um, of course, Jeanne d'Arc has a special mention because, you know, she inspired the French uh, when they were basically had their asses kicked um, after the Battle of Agincourt. And she persuaded Charles VIII to go to Reims to be uh, coronated, as was the ritual, and take back his kingdom. Um, actually, was at the castle, which is now in ruins there. So basically, France was in this really desperate state that essentially when Charles died, that Henry V would be the heir to France and the uh, the French and the English here, as you can see, they had, this is all Eleanor of Aquitaine's land that she brought into the monarchy and they managed to get some of this back. But the Bur uh, Dukes of Burgundy were on the English side and the, the English had all of this land and the French got beaten back to essentially the Loire Valley here. And he, she goes to his castle in Chinon and says, you know, you must come and, um, and, and uh, you must, you know, you must defeat them he must defeat the English. But of course she gets captured by those perfidious Burgundians in 1430. And the English burn her as a witch in the marketplace of uh, Reims, which is not on the map, but it's, it's up here um, in the Loire Valley. No, no, so this is the Loire, it's in the Seine Valley, the Seine, right? It's, you go up the Seine towards Normandy and uh, you get to, uh, you get there and they burned her in the marketplace. Why was she a witch? She dressed like a man. You know, across so many cultures, shamanism and cross-dressing are, are related. Um, and this was seen as prima facie evidence she was a witch. So she crosses boundary and goes against nature, just like sorcery. There's a certain, um, there's a certain poetry to that, to at least to the medieval mind. So poor Jean d'Arc. Um, anyway, something clearly happened in society between Eleanor's time and Jones, right? Um, besides the fact that one's a noble woman and one is a peasant girl, right? But hierarchy and legitimacy become established by tradition and women might not be in positions of authority by virtue of blood, right? Um, but warfare is not the only sort of fighting one might engage in in the Middle Ages. There's also the duel. And we see conflicting and ambiguous information about women there. So a duel, a bit about a duel. Duels were not fought for honor until later. The, a duel is basically a sort of trial by ordeal. It's a trial, it's we are trying to find a hidden truth. We can't know the fact of the matter. So instead of having the Senate vote on it, you know, what they're doing with Trump right now, um, it is, has to be, uh, you know, it has to be um, uh, resolved somehow, right? We need to resolve this conflict in society. So you and you go over there and you fight. And women, of course, were not required to duel, though, of course, um, uh, duel might be fought um, 
over a woman or her chastity. For instance, in the uh, uh, what happened here, Jean de Corot, his wife was raped by um, his neighbor, Jacques Legree. Uh, this is the uh, Ridley Scott movie, The Last Duel, that's coming out. And in 1386, they wound up um, fighting a duel because uh, sim her simply saying, this man, you know, this man assaulted me was not enough because a woman's word did not hold up in court. So they actually had to fight a duel over that. So again, we come to the misogyny, right? But it doesn't mean that female duelists were not a possibility because in Germanic law codes, um, in certain cases, like unwitnessed cases, rape, women themselves could fight as duels. And there's some evidence that such a combat actually took place in Bern in Switzerland in 1288 with the woman winning. Uh, two mentions in Chronicles. And actually in Fechtbooker, we do have this, I mean, mind you, there's a bit of nostalgia about this, right? There's a bit of imagination and nostalgia because these are written for an increasingly irrelevant um, increasingly irrelevant um, nightly class. But here, Hans Tahafer shows techniques for this. So the woman gets a veil with a rock in it, and the man has to stand in the pit, and he gets this club. And the uh, here, the woman, you know, here, she, he's trying to drag her into the pit, and she's trying to bash him with, with the rock. Um, so in different techniques. Later, Paulus Kahl, instead of having the woman win, restores the gender norms uh, by having the man win. So this, you know, so what they're doing here is there's actually comments on, on gender and gender roles um, by who, by does the woman, you know, vindicate herself or does the, does the man triumph? And here they, you know, restore the right order of the world. Essentially, as time goes on, things start getting more misogynistic. Not that they were so great to begin with. Um, skipping ahead, right? Skipping ahead to the early modern era. So we go, let's go up to the 16th century. We're here in the rapier era. Uh, the duel for the point of honor has become commonplace. And of course, there's all these treatises on how to do that. Um, partially because of what we call the military revolution, because warfare had changed to gunpowder armies. Castles are no longer, and strong points are no longer so important because of course can, as you can see in the lower right, can batter down a fortress wall. And we start to have the consolidation of large states. We start having like, you know, France, England has already pretty much consolidated because it's an island, et cetera, et cetera. Because um, only, only, you know, the bigger your territorial unit is a sort of Darwinian pressure to larger and larger um, political units, okay? Um, and so the dueling field and also, of course, the fencing style become the place where you perform your martial masculinity. This, of course, is the famous duel between the uh, Chateaune and Jarnac took place in France in, I think, the 1560s. Uh, which brings me to the background image, Ribera's Duel de Mujeres, which is painted in 1536, but it's about something that supposedly happened in 1552 in Naples, the home of the, uh, the duel for the point of honor. Um, over the um, the love of a man named named Fabio of all things, I'm sure he had fantastic hair, and they they're actually granted a field for this to to do this, and this is completely fantastic, right? And they actually fought um, in armor on horseback apparently, and um, Isabella won. But this idea, right? And this this is a man's view, right? This is a man a man's view of two women fighting, and it's portrayed something as this allegorical fight of, of um, virtues and vices, but it's also very much the male gaze, right? They're attractive, they're not at all sweaty, they're kind of glowing, they look very chaste. We'll see as this transforms. So here's a slightly less male gazy view. This is Catalina de Horacio. She was born 1585 to a noble family in the Basque country of Spain. Um, she's educated in a convent, she runs away, dresses like a man, goes to the new world, um, fights against Native Americans, so she's an imperializer, serves under her own brother, who she later accidentally kills in a duel. She kills a lot of men in tavern brawls, moves back to Europe, is granted dispensation by the Pope to uh, wear men's clothes, and wrote a autobiography, supposedly her autobiography, found in the 18th century, might be spurious, we don't know. She dies in 1650, but we do have this portrait of her. And so this is a, you know, a, a woman who, we, you know, we, we probably should say actually that, you know, she, she's trans in some sense and that she dressed and lived as a member of the other, other gender, right? Um, 
what ha what these what do these women though all have in common? They all happen in the age of print. And these sensational stories can make a publisher a lot of money. Here's another one, right? These two, uh, this duel, this true account of a duel between two sisters uh, close to Bordeaux, um, where one, um, you know, where they're using these, the uh, one is a sword and the other has got a got a sling, and this is, you know, this is, they made people made these things to make money, right? It's okay, women fighting. And there's something salacious about this, okay? There's like, I want to kind of get to this idea that there, we're marking this idea of women and fighting, right? And in fact, if we look at literature in this period, this idea of female combatants like Bradamante and Orlando Furioso, or uh, the continuation of Orlando Furioso is uh, Jerusalem Liberata, Liberata, Jerusalem, Jerusalem Liberated by um, Tasso. And these women, these fictional women, are um, brought to life by uh, Claudio Monteverdi in uh, an opera and, and uh, numerous painters. And of course, you hear, right, this is, you know, very mannerist. Um, the exposed, note the exposed breast. The exposed breast is, oh, yes, I am female, revealing her feminin femininity to her, um, to her, um, lover slash combatant who she's fighting anonymously, right? We start getting the eroticization of the female combatant in an era when soldiering was becoming increasingly professional and male, right? In uh, an era in which, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, Eleanor of Aquitaine could not really be imagined. And sometimes the theater became reality, like uh, La Maupin, right? Julie de Albigny, she's, a well, she's uh, born to uh, an attache to a, a nobleman. She becomes the um, mistress of the Count of Armagnac. Armagnac is in, in um, I'm actually drinking uh, Calvados, which was also made in Normandy. Um, but she ran away with a fencing master named Saran, um, made a living giving fencing exhibitions in the south of France gets sick of his ass, takes up with a young lady, breaks her out of a nunnery while setting on fire, um, takes, uh, also takes a, a young man she'd win in a duel as one of her lovers. She becomes an opera singer in Paris, defeats three men in a duel because they took exception to her kissing another young lady at a ball. And, you know, how much of this is, is true? How much is fiction? We can't really know, but, you know, there are people who made movies and stuff on her. Um, and we, you know, there's also note this this um, this, this kind of trans, uh, transgressive sexuality to both her and Catalina de Rassero, right? That these things go hand in hand. Um, also, interestingly, she played Clorinda herself in a in stage role. And this whole sensationalistic duel of women theme really gets continued in the 19th century. Um, supposedly, right? This supposedly happened, right? Uh, between uh, two, uh, two noble women in Liechtenstein um, over flower arranging. They had disagreement about flower arranging, so supposedly, and they fought a duel, and they supposedly did this strict, right? Uh, because men would, uh, after Lister, of course, discovered bacteria, um, men um, would fight shirtless in order that the bacteria from the shirt would not be pressed into the wound. They disinfected the epes. Um, and so they supposedly, supposedly, this is all very allegedly, I got called out in someone's literature review for thinking, supposedly thinking this was real. Um, and uh, this, uh, and so, the, you know, so supposedly this happened and this becomes like a whole genre of 19th, early 20th century cheesecake photos. Because as we know, like, like, um, Nudity is polyvalent, right? It can be proof, proof of femininity, like Clarinda. It can be, of course, salacious. It can be maternal, think the Virgin Mary, as well as other things. But this whole thing quickly gets pressed into service in this whole genre of Victorian porn, uh, Victorian, Victorian Edwardian porn, right? So this is all about the men. It, so whatever happened, right? Let's suppose that, the, that this actually happened. It totally gets pressed into service immediately for the male gaze, right? Which brings us to the question really of, okay, what about women in their own right? What about women fencing, right? Throw away the male gaze. So these are, um, uh, we have definitely happened, right? A few scattered references to women who may or may not have participated in sex school. The first goes back, the first, I mean, there's a woman in the very first book we have, uh, Walpurgis in 133. 
uh, southern Germany, 1325, probably at a cathedral school. Who is she, right? Who is this woman appearing in this in this book? A real woman, right? Um, Val uses the term Amazon, not me. Um, some women who live in the town and fence with them. Uh, someone's girlfriend. We don't know. Um, Val says she's unexplained. Best concluded, she's a real woman, not an allegory, an image of anything, right? She's allegorical, probably not. Um, who's simply fencing because she likes to fence. Another example, Anna Mendoza, famous beauty, reportedly lost her eye in a fencing accident. So she wore a patch, which everyone thought was very exotic, right? Um, women from Iberia, because of the frontier nature of Iberian society, you know, we have this whole history of, of women defending towns, women going to war in Iberia. Um, was this maybe more allowable there? Um, trans, uh, the Chevalier de Ion, one of the very, or Chevalier with, uh, um, um, with the, uh, the, uh, with the, um, with the E, right? Because she changed her gender during her, her life. And she actually lived as a secret, she actually went undercover in Imperial Russia as a woman. And then from 1779 on, she lived as a woman and she was still uh, a very famous fencer. And this is her famous, well, it wasn't really a, a bout. It was just like, you know, a couple touches like haphazardly, but here it's like commemorated in this very, like it's some sort of formal bout. Her fencing the Chevalier de St. George and gaining a touch on him. He was one of the most famous fencers of the, uh, of the era of the 18th century. He was also um, of, um, of African descent, I think his, his mother was um, uh, enslaved in Jamaican, but he was son of uh, an enslaved woman and uh, a white planter. And he was given an excellent education. He was also a composer. Uh, he's more famous actually as a composer than he is as a fencer. And um, they had this famous bout. Um, other examples, I can give a few other examples of, um, of uh, female, of, um, there was, there was another example of a, of a female fencer, which um, I came across, which I will find, um, but this is just for examples. La Jagorina, um, she um, basically became like a 19th century WWF wrestler um, at these exhibitions, but her, instead of like wrestling, what she would do is she'd um, wield military sabers and bash in the heads of male uh, challengers on horseback and because she was an excellent writer and swordswoman. Um, and she was also a vaudeville actress. This is how she made her living in the, in the West. She wound up living in California. Uh, probably one of the more uh, well-paid professionals of her athletes of her, of her time. Um, um, oh, the first, the first image I showed, that's what I was gonna say. This first image, um, these are Austrian women um, led by their, their teacher, Professor Hartle, who came over to America and they gave these exhibitions of fencing with, with swords and foils and daggers. They've got, you see, they've got uh, foils and they've got daggers. So they're doing sort of a form of early form of HEMA and they came over and one of them um, actually did these sorts of exhibition bouts. Um, um, uh, Matilda Jager, Jagerman of Vienna fought a man named uh, Theodore Rosenberg uh, with sharp epes uh, for a $500 bet in uh, Denver in 1889. So this is like, you know, cowboys, Indians, and, and fencing Austrian women. So, um, and of course, as we start getting into the 20th century, there are a lot of, and especially sport, because uh, fencing becomes a more um, commonly accepted modern sport, um, that we start getting very famous female fencers. Helene Mayer is an excellent example. She's half Jewish, but Hitler offered to make her an honorary Aryan if she would compete for Germany in the 34 Olympics. She said, screw you, she moved to America. Um, and so there are a number of notable female competitive fencers of the 20th century. But of course, women, there's still a bunch of sexism, is a bunch of sexism in the sport. Women's saber was only brought in in the 2004 Olympics that women were allowed to compete in saber because it used to be women were only allowed to fence foils, more ladylike than eventually FA. And then finally, you know, women's saber, which was practiced, of course, you know, at lower levels, um, became a thing in the 2004 Olympics. So, and of course they're, you know, no end to the cheesecake, right? This, again, the male gaze always has to commodify everything. Um, and the thing is, is that, um, 
the blurred lines between fiction and reality kind of continue today. Meryl Zagunas, right? She's probably going to be competing in the Olympics again, won a number of gold medals. And they used to have these sort of window saber masks so they can see each other. And the thing about Mariel is that she always wore eye makeup, right? She's, she always wore eye makeup. There's a sort of this like pressure because if you're an Olympic athlete, you are, um, you, you know, you, you also have your, your media presence. And this idea is she didn't just have to be a good fencer, but she had to be pretty all the damn time. Um, this is of course, you know, Ronda Rousey, um, MMA fighter, uh, turf, but she also, um, but she also, you know, has trying to advance her acting career. So there's that. And so this, this sort of idea of fetish object and male gaze kind of continues, right? Um, notably, if the notable exception of Brianna Tarth. Um, but that's one of the good things about, you know, about Game of Thrones is that neither Arya nor Brianna portray as anything other than what they are, uh, quite opposite sort of the male gaziness of other other genres, right? And this is the whole thing. So conclusion, right? Um, aristocratic women in the Middle Ages could wield, could wield the sword, had military authority because of their position in society or because of necessity, um, usually seen as laudable. Um, in the early modern era, we start to see a shift. Um, warfare becomes more professionalized. Women are disenfranchised. Women who are also swordswomen are become com I use commodities. They're both unusual and they're commercialized. So they're, they're weirdness. And of course, there it's it is sexed up and this continues into the 19th century. Um, and that concludes the presentation. And I think I found I can't remember what the heck. Um, I cannot remember. Oh, hey, Marissa. I cannot remember what the heck um, the other example I found was, but I did find another example. I probably wrote it into something. Oh, I remember, I remember what. There was a account, an, um, a, a, a fex school in Strasbourg where there was a woman who participated, one of the wives of the fencers participated. And this was actually told like a generation after it happened in a, in a, in a chronicle, a Strauss, Strauss uh, bourgeois chronicle, um, which, suggests that it was so unusual that it was remembered for generations and and put down. And this was, of course, you know, maybe I can do another lecture on um, on fencing, you know, on, on Strasbourg in the context that Joachim Mayer wrote in one of our, our primary sources. But um, I'll do that. I'll do that later. So, yeah, cool. So, y'all got any questions or anything? So. Or not. This is a rookie question. All right. Um, but for dueling, um, what, like, what, when, it, especially when it was like, all right, now they're bashing their heads in with like sock, socks full of rocks. Um, was it like to the death or was it like to the injury or is it just once we got to honor, was it just like rules where it was touching or? Uh, no, it was. Um... If, if you were not dead, then they would take you off and they'd hang you from the scaffolding elected by the field and that, because it was only for capital crimes. Okay. Like like rape, right? It wasn't so. Okay. Yeah. Mm. There was an idea that you, you hit sort of in brief, which was the idea that it was more permissible for the woman to defend the castle because it was defending the home were, were there significant historical examples of that? Or was that just a, a context in which- Oh, loads. It, it, sorry, go on. Oh, yeah, yeah, loads. Um, from, who is it? Katerina, I can't remember who, but she- You gave us one, but yeah. then there was another that was just sort of, oh, it's, it's good for us, the men, to go off on the crusade because the women are holding down the fort, you know? Uh, the- I can give you another example. I'm gonna find it. Uh, I have the one with make a. Uh, so there is uh, uh, Katarina Sforza. Okay, so so Katarina S F um S F O R Z A. Katarina Sforza, 
right? <laughs> this is like, um, this this is one of the uh, the. Um, this may not have actually happened, but so they're besieging her castle. They take her son's prison. They say, "Give up the castle," or uh, this is actually Rome. She's supporting the Pope, I think. But give up the, you know, uh, give, um, uh, give up the, the castle, or we will execute your children. And she gets up on the walls and yell and pulls up her skirt and yells, "Do what you like. I have here the, the means to make others, to make more." So she. She, you know, she was a badass, and a lot of these women were badasses. And there were a lot, a lot of examples of this. Um, a lot, I, you know, um, you know, Burning, uh, Burning Jean, the the Duchess of, of Brittany, is an example. Um, uh, Nicola de la Haye, uh, Sheriff of Lincolnshire. There's a num numerous examples of of women taking part in sieges during the Crusades. Um, women taking part in defending castles and in, 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 uh, in sieges. Would you characterize that as part of a, a greater idea of, you know, the, the strict gender roles kind of breaking down in crisis where you just need able-bodied people to fill roles? Or is this a more specific phenomenon? Partially, but also like you said, I mean, the castle is also a home, right? It's not just a building. It's, a, you know, it's not just a, a fortress, but it's a place where people live. So I guess in, in some ways that's more acceptable. And also because, I mean, there was a delegate, there was a gender delegation of responsibility, offense versus domestic defense. But don't forget that, and women would take part in siegecraft like all the time because you did not want to be, have your, your town taken. Right? The, um, the, 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 that was an all hands on deck kind of situation. And I think that you, you really do have to, um, you, you know, you, you, you know, you really do need to recognize that that was, you know, it was part of the expected reality, right? That, that women may not go in expeditions, but on the other hand, also looking at gendered labor, men can only go in expeditions because the women were doing the, the, all the domestic work behind the, behind the scenes, right? So, so. So I, I know this is a historical European martial arts thing, but there's, you also have like characters like Kudalun and like, I think I'm saying this right, Ching Shi, who was the pirate queen in China. Oh yeah. And you know, in the whole, you know, whole idea of, um, women the naginata is supposedly the women's weapon of course samurai used it as well mm -hmm. and the whole japanese martial arts tradition you know of um women you know women w women defending the home mm -hmm. so well uh, referencing pirates wasn't there a woman who had a fairly successful career as a pirate leader in the caribbean as well i have lost the name but uh, and I Palmer, I think. recall. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it was Anne too. But yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and something, well, Bonnie, Bonnet? And Bonnie, yeah. Bonnie, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, hmm. But I, I seem to recall a story of uh, Douglas uh, being at war with Edward I and his wife and his young son being besieged in her castle or his castle uh, while he was away. Uh, and ultimately uh, rescued by Robert Bruce, of course, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, these sorts of things happen pretty, you know, kind of often, right? This was, I mean, of course, there's the, the rescue, but the, the, you know, the, the erasure, let's put it another way, right? When we look at history, how have women been erased? And that this idea, you know, this, this idea that like we're discovering new things, I mean, why are, or maybe it's that this story has always been there and it's always been something that's there, but but that there's been, um, a that there's been erasure, and that that people prefer to look at things and write about things in a certain way because that fits their preconceived way of the way the world works, 
whereas that's not really the way the world ever worked. Yeah, and of course, the medieval castle is a really small community. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole point of a castle. You can hold it with a tiny force uh, mm -hmm. against a much larger force, but it's a household. Mm -hmm. And the woman of the house would be somebody that the men who were left behind to defend the castle, which were probably the younger, the older, they might be experienced, but they maybe were not up to taking the field right now, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be accustomed to her running the house anyway, in the absence of her husband, and probably running the house all the time. So her leading them would not have seemed strange because it was her domain to be in control of that household. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So of the different paradigms that we discussed at the very beginning of when a woman um, might be violent, hunting wasn't really brought up. Um, oh, no. Yeah. So how did, how did, I mean, how did that play into the a woman, de woman definitely hunted, right? That's, um, I actually have an article coming out on, med on medieval sports and games, and I cover women and hunting in that. But um, I, I mean, that's not violence against, I didn't really cover that because it's like not violence against humans, but um, women, <laughs> women definitely hunted, and there were certain acceptable parameters, um, you know, with bows or um, hawk, you know, certainly hawking too. I mean, I mean, flying hawks was, flying falcons was, was, was you know, very acceptable, but hunting par force. You know, we think like, oh. yeah. Um, but <coughs> Bill, if you're from the excuse me, I, I swallowed wrong. Uh, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna mute Bill while he coughs up along. Okay, I can do that. Um, so the uh, you can unmute too, right? So you can unmute too, but if you're a clown pick and then you can. Anyway, so the um, the um, hunting par force, right? Like you know, taking after boars with spears and dogs and stuff. That was more masculine activity, but there were there were certain acceptable forms of hunting. Again, you know, the Middle Ages were was a they were very into their gender roles. They were very, very into their gender roles, but you know, even violence was 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 gendered in that way. Like the 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 you know, if you if you're gonna commit violence, then you go and you you know, women defend home, um, men go wherever. But um, none. But even even male violence had to be enabled by by women, right? In that way, and then of course you know. For me, a lot of the interesting part is the transgression, the transgressive, the more transgressive things, the things that kind of broke that. Not just the situations where it's acceptable to break it, but the situations where, um, like the one Petrarch mentions, where it might, you know, where it might be um, just exceptional people in exceptional circumstances. So. Thank you. Uh, I had a question sort of to do with uh, basically how, um, so my, my kind of general conception, and maybe you can correct this overall, is as far as like people sort of being pressed into service, as far as like, you know, your Lord calls on you to, yeah. you know, do, to go to war on his or her behalf. I wonder, so for these like mixed gender forces, did they basically were women pressed into service in the same way? Or was it sort of like just an expectation that you would follow someone into service, like on a crusade or something like that? Or more that's, of a like opportunity to do that's something? A, that's a really interesting question. Because um, no, I mean, there's in no case anything where women were pressed into military service, always for men in arms, right? It's always requirements for men in arms. So where do these women come from? Um, a lot of them were immediate, you know, let's think of the people who go into, uh, who, who go, who go to war, um, nobles, nobles have households. So obviously a number of the household servants would come along. Um, people also, people were poor and or landless. 
people, women who are at loose ends, women who otherwise, you know, who otherwise may have moved to towns and gone into service, may instead choose to follow an army to perform necessary tasks. Um, people may get picked up um, as the army travels and things like that. But that's a very, very good question. It's like, you know, and that's still an open-ended question because we don't really have, you know, biographies of these women or prosopographies. Maybe they were local, you know, in maybe they were local women to the Holy Land. But they may have also been, you know, wives were accompanied, accompanying um, soldiers and things like things like that, uh, wives and servants. And of course, if, you know, wives would also have their own servants and their maid servants who would come along. So, you know, one person goes on crusade, and, but you got to imagine that they're, they may be bringing, you know, a, a whole retinue with them, which would include women. One thing, and maybe I've mentioned this to some of you before, uh, Alexander the Great's armies traveling across uh, the uh, area of uh, modern day Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, down into Palestine, into Egypt, and all over the place he formed cities and left his veterans in these cities that he created. If the veterans were by themselves, the cities wouldn't still be there. Well, uh, the was... fact was that the veterans mustered out in these places and the women who were attached to them went with them and formed this community. Well, that's very pre-medieval, but also in the case, and this also gets us to an interesting subject, right? That Alexander the Great um, had this deliberate policy of intermarriage mm. where Greek would be the common culture, but you know, you may speak Aramaic at home, being the common language of the ancient Near East, or you know, Greek at home or, or Coptic uh, if you're in Egypt or whatever. And uh, but then you'd all speak Greek and you can go visit your cousin who lives in you know Aleppo or something and you know trade routes and things like and things like that, and which, which spread, of course, Hellenism, but this idea of intermarriage. And intermarriage, we've talked about Robert Griesgard and, and Sikligate of Salerno, but this intermarriage, you know, you go, you defeat the local, you know, big dude, you, what do you do? You marry his daughter. And the, the Carolingians did this. This was common through history. This is the ethnogenesis, in fact, of the Latino people. The conquistadors come over, they didn't bring women with them. Um, they married the, the native women. This was advantageous to both sides. You're going to have bilingual, bicultural kids for the natives. The, um, the um, kids were not subject to the encomiendas, which was basically a system of enslavement. Um, there were a lot of, uh, of advantages to that, that it was more this idea of purity of blood, which is also a Spanish concept. It comes in uh, as part of the whole legacy of the Reconquista, but this is um, a later idea. And it's in the 19th century that you start drawing this cordon sanitaire between colonizers and colonized. And the, in the 19th century, people had a horror of miscegenation and they're afraid of that. They started sending women to the colonies. This is this photo I used to use in um, my, uh, my classes of a, of a English woman in India sitting having tea um, <laughs> on the uh on you know in front of an uh, a european style house being served by a, a south asian servant it why because women were brought over as the reproducers of culture because there was this horror of um miscegenation and acculturation this is of course why the jesuits were sent to goa in the first place because the portuguese were becoming acculturated to south asian ways and why not you know um this, this, this idea of women as the reproducers of culture, though, is also, is also a very, very big one. If we're talking about imperialism in general, um, both early modern and modern imperialism, the middle and the later we go, the more, the more people are, are kind of afraid of that. If you read uh, Rudyard Kipling's Kim, um, Kim is, you know, you know, they are careful to portray him as wholly European, but since he also spoke the language of the Souk, in addition to speaking English, he was seen as the ideal secret agent. But of course, there's also something transgressive about that. If you read, if you read Kipling, Kipling, you know, Kipling is one of my favorite authors, even though he is a imperialist par excellence, because he does have that ambivalent and 
ambivalence towards imperialism and amb ambiguity towards imperialism because um, he himself grew up in British India and um, slept with South Asian prostitutes as part of it, but also this idea of, you know, he's raised in the nursery by South Asian servants and then they bring him downstairs and present him in the Victorian way to his parents in the evening. They, they have to remind him, make sure to speak English to mommy and daddy. And this idea of, uh, if, if you look at Mowgli, the figure of Mowgli in um, the Jungle Book, this idea of wanting to belong and becoming and the idea of, of being part of the uh, being part of the, the the colonized area, and this this longing to belong to it, but then not being allowed to belong to it, is this 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 beautiful tension in Kipling. I think he's a much more complex author than people give him credit for. But um, that really belongs to my animals and literature class, which uh, is not our subject. So sorry, I drone on. All right. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions specifically about that, or should I continue ranting about Kipling? <laughs> or, uh, all right, go have dinner then? All right. So yeah, I gotta uh, hop off, but that was cool. Thanks, Ken. You're welcome. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Talking. Don't apologize. Don't apologize. Good Good night, all right. I managed to make and eat an entire dinner during that, so I declare. <laughs> Yay. Well, I couldn't because I'd use my mouth for other things. If only I had a talking. Throw mouth. another mouth. If only I had a talk. What am I like? Some sort of Lovecraft creature? Mm. If, I only, <laughs> if I only had a talking. Hand. All right. I'll, I'll see you guys hopefully uh, Sunday, right? Or, mm. right. Yeah. Uh, so we're supposed to get snow again. So. Yeesh. No. Look. Uh, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> the snow Keep was being awesome. online, then I can show up. <laughs> Yeah. It wasn't that bad out there. I drove home from work. It was. <laughs> yeah, you don't live on a mountain, sir. I also drove home from work, and my car span out not once but twice. <laughs> yeah, I would prefer. And I've got four wheel drive. I would prefer if you guys didn't. I, I have to go. I'm in Manchester at Libby's, uh, Manchester, Connecticut. So I'd have to drive 84 east to. I guess I'd, I'd take the Pike for that little bit, but yeah, it's. I'd rather people didn't die for fencing. It would be good. That'd I took be, all, for glory. For glory, yeah. For, for, glory. <laughs> for exercise. Sid actually, actually canceled her classes. So, yeah. We will do it on Sunday. We had fencings yesterday at PVFA. It was good. Also, I just moved and I remembered I'm hurt. So, that's another thing. So, I that's just more important. take it easy. I'm drinking. Hang in there. <laughs> drink drink through it actually i'm a really bad drinker because like i haven't had more than a sip of that i've been drinking seltzer so it's all good stay hydrated rather yeah i shouldn't drink in front of people anyway so um, I mean, we know yeah but i need to be a i need to be, yeah well not ready drinks so yeah <laughs> thing to, to to be aware of right yeah all right. I will see you guys hopefully on Sunday, okay? Bye-bye. Okay, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.